preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I have no introduction because I was supposed to be lecturing in, the, in another room, which was a good deal more intimate. I'm gratified that we had to move. The subject to which the series is to address itself is uh, interaction between different strands of culture and towards the end of antiquity, the eastern end of the Mediterranean. We will be looking mainly at the Hellenistic Age, which is to say the centuries following the conquest of Alexander the Great at the end of the fourth century BC, because though these contacts had gone on for millennia before, the pace was very suddenly accelerated at that time. And more important, because during the Hellenistic age, at least in my judgment, the outlooks which have determined the contours of Western civilization first took shape so that if you look at classical antiquity, or if you look at the ancient period in the ancient Near East, you will find it impressive, of course, but a little stark and a little remote. When you move in the Hellenistic age, you feel right at home. It is like another country of Europe, a foreign country to be sure. We have learned in our time to be very receptive to the idea of one world, we know that there are mutual influences from country to country, and that these influences move very quickly because of our improved communications. Our problem is to maintain whatever native values we have, at the same time learn from the rest of the world. We've learned also that antiquity was one world in the same way at least we've become receptive to the idea. I still can remember uh, my own early education where I was told that sacred history began with Abram and secular history began with Homer and the two preceded by insulated channels and never touched each other except pretty late in the time of Christianity when they touched each other with hostility. My own impression is that these two peoples are very like. They're almost like siblings. This contrast, this dichotomy, which uh, Victorians drew between Hellenism and Hebraism is at least an oversimplification. Because if you conceive of Hebraism as being concerned mainly with relations with the supernatural, with the divine, I would say that there's not a single page of Greek literature, of Greek poetry, which is not similarly concerned with relations with the divine. And if the Greeks are concerned with beauty and with politics and with uh, things of that sort, with secular things, of course the Hebrews also fought battles and occasionally won them. They also created political institutions and they also loved and wrote magnificent poetry. So that what we have, are dealing with is rather than two alien bodies that are unknown to each other, and hostile to each other, we're dealing rather with sibling rivals. And of course, the differences in siblings do become terribly important. And this evening, I want to deal with one of these uh, phases, and that is the Greek phase, uh, and proceed to deal with the other in subsequent uh, lectures. This is not a very easy thing to do. It reminds me a little bit of the man, I think, in Dickens, who was told off to write a paper on Chinese philosophy, and his procedure was to read the encyclopedia article on China, and then read the encyclopedia article on philosophy, and put them together. This is not the best way to do it. Well, I don't propose to tell you tonight all about the Greeks. I've spent a fairly long lifetime studying them, and I don't know all about them yet. 
But I do want to talk about the salient things and the things which differ most markedly, most boldly, from the traditions which come from the East. And I think that all of these can be subsumed under the word humanism. And this is what I wish to talk about. There are certain ideals and practices of humanism which are consistent all through Greek history. They appear in Homer. They appear markedly in Epicureanism at the end of the period. They are responsible, it seems to me, for the Greek achievements in literature and philosophy, particularly in politics. I will say at once that they are not the only strand in Greek thought. Humanism is not, because there were others which cannot be read out of the book. There's no orthodoxy and no heterodoxy. There are a great many people who are much concerned with humanism and impatient with Plato, for example, who has been condemned by certain German scholars as an, as an alien drop, fremdes Blutstropfen, an alien drop of blood in the Greek blood, bloodstream. I myself would not know how to define Greek without, and, and, and leave Plato out. Now, the doctrine of humanism is formulated in crystalline form in the dictum of Protagoras, which you all know, man is the measure of all things. And since one of the essential differences is between the two points of view that I wish to talk about, is the view of man and the view of man's relation to the supernatural, this is what I wish to discuss first. The first thing that one notices is the people who make the measure of man something external to man, some divine dispensation, find this shocking, find this arrogant and presumptuous. And therefore, I must say that the same Protagoras who said this in the middle of the 5th century BC also said, of the gods, I do not speak because I cannot know. And I would suggest that so far from being arrogant and presumptuous and blasphemous, this represents <clears throat> the very highest kind of theology. There have been sects in, I think, every religion which have held that any predication about deity, any predication about deity is blasphemous. To say that God is good is as wicked as to say that God is evil or that God has a red beard. Because in the absence of revelation, which the Greeks did not have, how can you know? And if you are so sure, isn't this an impertinence and a presumption in itself? And in the Greek view, the sphere of the gods and the sphere of men is disparate, is diverse. Man knows that two and two, for example, makes four. And the ordinary practice that we have is to watch the world, and if the divine dispensation seems to make two and two equal four, we applaud and say, well done, God, and hand out a brass button or sing a hymn. But how can we know? Perhaps God's arithmetic is two plus two is equal to five. Perhaps he operates by non-Euclidean geometry. This does not, however, mean that man must assimilate himself to God's ways to find out what they are because the spheres are disparate. He has got to go on making two plus two equal four. And this is where we get the tragic view of life, which is characteristic of the Greeks, because the gods do what, it's for what becomes them to do and men do what becomes man to do. And if a man behaves well as man, behaves well as man and is nevertheless tripped up by forces which are outside his control, indeed outside his understanding, there we have tragedy. And it is really impossible to have tragedy in this sense under Christianity or in the, and indeed under any monotheism where you are told what is right and what is wrong. We will go into that uh, presently. You can see from the interventions, the kind of interventions that you have, uh, say in Homer, of the divine in the affairs of men, just how the wind blows, because you don't have miracles interrupting the path of nature. The sense they're anticipating Spinoza, God cannot work a miracle. He works by nature, through nature, and he cannot be contrary to himself. 
And the typical uh, intervention is of a man being able to operate at his most efficient. He is hitting on all cylinders. All of his pores are opened. And I think this is important to realize. You do not import a miracle interrupting the ways of nature, but you emphasize a man's humanity. For example, or oh, you can even have gods that are indifferent to men. In fact, they all are. You see, we have the notion which comes naturally with monotheism, with, um, uh, let me remind you that I'm not an evangel for the Olympians. I'm trying only to understand, but uh, I'm trying to understand sympathetically. And uh, let me say at once that I believe that there's no, there's no value in, in studying an exotic culture and an exotic literature if all we're going to get is corroboration of prejudices which we already have. Uh, the best way to corroborate them is, is by looking at something else and then deciding that you like this or that you don't. But I, I, I'm terribly afraid I sound as if I were a uh, hot gospeler for the, for the Olympians. But the, the point that I was making is this, that the gods seem as if they ought to be very close to man because their emotions are the same, their physique is the same as human. They should be very close, and in fact, they are more remote from man than is the transcendent deity. Because there's one very great difference. They live forever, and they're very beautiful, and very young, and they stay young. And this makes a greater gulf, it seems to me, of the greatest gulf possible. We uh, monotheists seem to believe, though we don't say so, that God's chief business is to keep book on us. He's, this, is, this is his main concern. Well, the Greeks never thought that their gods were leaning over a battery of IBM machines and punching holes in cards. As a matter of fact, in, the, in Homer, Apollo can say, why soil my hands with these creatures of a day? I will go off and be a god. And among the Epicureans at the end of the Greek period, uh, they said very specifically, if gods had to mind men, there wouldn't be an advantage in being a god. So they were all having a divine picnic all the time. This is one of the arrogances of, of, uh, of devout people that uh, think that, that that is the way it's done. But I was going to speak about interventions. I'll mention those that I'll presume that you remember. In the beginning of the Homer, in the beginning of the Iliad, Achilles, in an open meeting, is drawing his sword, and he's about to attack Agamemnon. Athena, the goddess, grasps him by the hair. When he turns, she stares into his face with a blazing look. It is important to realize that nobody else saw her. Homer says so. Only Achilles saw her. He puts his sword back into the scabbard because he bethinks himself that there may be better ways of avenging himself on, a, on Agamemnon than attacking him. You notice she didn't hold his wrist. She didn't import a miracle to stop nature, to stop him. She enabled him to operate at his most efficient and his most intelligent, to lose his, his wrath. And most of the interventions, not all of them, because Homer is many layers, are of the same kind. There's a story which children were always told about Heracles. A farmer had his cart mired down. He couldn't get it out of the mud. So he prayed to Heracles, who was a big, strong man, to come and help him. And sure enough, Heracles turned up, whereupon the man proceeded to sit down on the bank and do the equivalent of smoking a cigarette while Heracles did his job. Heracles says, not that way, my friend. Put your shoulder to the wheel. Something will happen. I will touch the wagon. I will touch you or something. But you cannot expect the divine to come in and push the wagon out while you are sitting on the bank or praying or whatever you're doing. Now, another aspect of this, which is terribly important, is the fact that the Greeks were polytheists. Now, this is it's terribly hard for us to realize what polytheism means, because we are all monotheists. It doesn't matter at all what the state of our belief is. We might be atheists. But if we are atheists, what we disbelieve in is one God, not a multiplicity of gods. So we're in effect monotheists anyhow, because there's two millennia of this tradition to which we've been bred, which all of our literature reflects, and so on. 
But if you've got polytheism, and as the Greeks had it, they're not only a multiplicity of gods, but they're various categories of gods. They are not, therefore, all omnipotent or omniscient, and there is a very great responsibility on the part of man to decide which he is going to follow, because each of them has its own sanctions, its own validity, but he can't please them all, and so he must decide. Now, I'll again cite literature and cite something which I imagine is familiar to all of you, and that is the Orestia of Aeschylus. Clytemnestra has killed her husband Agamemnon, and Apollo, who is concerned with order, with aristocracy, has told Orestes to go and avenge the murder of his father, because this is a very bad precedent for kings to be killed, and particularly to be killed by women. So Orestes is going to avenge his father, but in order to do that, it turns out that he has got to kill his mother, which to another set of gods, the Furies, who represent the primitive chthonic earth deities, is the worst crime in the calendar because they're concerned with kindred blood and the closest kinship in the world is that between a son and his mother. And uh, well, in fact, we still think that it's at least rude for a son to kill his mother. Uh, he's in a cleft stick. He has got to mind one and, and outrage the other, whichever he does. I can cite you many other cases where this is the case. I cite this one because it's very salient and very familiar. He, is, he has not got a bill of pains and penalties. He has not got thou shalt do this and thou shalt not do the other. Uh, he is not a villain. There are no villains when you've got a polytheism because whatever you choose to do, you can find some authority for it. It may not be the proper authority. You may have guessed wrong. Or to take a play like the Apollotus of Euripides, where this chaste young man decides to follow, uh, to follow Artemis and scorns Aphrodite. The result is that Aphrodite does him to death which is too bad because he was a nice fellow and he was actually following Artemis, who doesn't help him at all. The only solace is that if he had followed Aphrodite, Artemis would have done him to death. So that the human responsibility is very great. Now, I want to wander on a little bit longer with a couple of other aspects of this. We talk about heroes a little bit. Now, hero, I must say at once, does not mean in the Greek simply the most important character in a literary work, uh, creative literature of uh, art, of a drama or a novel. It has a technical meaning. A hero is a man who is dead. He has to be dead before he becomes a hero, just as a saint has to be dead before he becomes a saint, who, whose career had somehow been very significant, had somehow pushed back the horizons of what is possible for humanity as enriched people. Not because he was a good do-gooder, he never intended to do this, but it worked out that way, in consequence of which he receives a cult, which doesn't mean a great deal. It means simply that on his name day, one day a year, at his heroin, his shrine, which might be only a stone or a stick, uh, offerings might be made to him, a uh, little wine, a handful of flowers put on his grave. And this is what a hero is. Um, we will look at a few of them later. It's interesting to see the analogs among other peoples. Um, Originally, the hero was doubtless a ghost, the anthropologists tell us, and the offerings were intended to allay the ghost. He might come back and do you some harm, and so you give him something to keep him quiet. But other people had similar institutions. For example, an important man among the Egyptians was embalmed, mummified, and then a spare head of stone was put in, in case the first one deteriorated, and if he was rich enough, a second stone head might be put in in case the original stone head deteriorated. And then this was all sealed up. This was for the use of the deceased and nobody else. Which is quite different, let's say, from our 
celebrating the birthday of George Washington or Abraham Lincoln. We eat uh, chocolate hatchets and cherry pies towards the end of February. Not to do George any good, he really doesn't need it, but perhaps to do ourselves some good, to have in mind a distinguished and beneficial career uh, to which we are grateful and from which we profit. We go on and look at saints, which is an, an institution very closely analogous to the hero. The saint also has to be dead, and he also receives a cult for an extraordinary career. But the difference, it seems to me, is very startling, because to put it perhaps by oversimplification, the saint gets to be a saint by shaking off his humanity and assimilating himself to an ideal outside of humanity, a superhuman ideal. The Greek becomes a saint by emphasizing his humanity. And if you look at the list of heroes, Greek saints, you will find that they're all very prickly characters. The ideal among them, say, is Achilles, who's a very bad man, wouldn't fight in time of war, wouldn't help his comrades in their desperate need. But he somehow did things which enriched all of us by his attention to self. He was obsessed with self, as a matter of fact. So he's a hero. Ajax is a very great hero. He was a brute. He was cruel to his wife. He was cruel to his crew who was dependent upon him. He was absolutely obsessed with self, cruel to his son even. And yet you have got to decide, society has got to decide, do we want this man, a man who single-handed can hold back the entire attacking Trojan army who's pressing on to burn the Greek ships, or do we not? If we want this kind of man, let us not expect Casper Milk Toast or Namby Pamby. You cannot take the coin of humanity and split it in two and say, I will take the heads and I will throw the tails away. It doesn't work that way because humanity is one and a man becomes a hero by doing something extraordinary. He often sticks his neck out and has his head lopped off, but he's a hero nevertheless. I'll say a word or two about the Oedipus, which again I assume that everyone knows. Now, when I was taught the Oedipus for the first time, uh, I was told that Oedipus had done a number of naughty things, you know, like killing his father and marrying his mother, and at the end received his comeuppance. This was proper. And in my early youth, I was much shocked at the unfairness of it, because Oedipus hadn't meant to do these things. If we read the play that way, we misunderstand the Greeks, we misunderstand the problems of fusion that I have to come to, because the play of Sophocles is intended to show that Oedipus is a good man and as a hero, he wins, just as Antigone wins, she also has died. Because here's a man who has gone on pursuing the truth unflaggingly, after it's become manifestly dangerous for him to continue on this line of investigation, uh, this is a fine thing to do. And to say that he had tragic faults like a short temper and suspicion of his friends misses the point because a man without a short temper and suspicion of his friends couldn't do what Oedipus did do. We cannot take the heads without the tails. So as I said before, this is tragedy. The man has done what is for a man to do and he's done it magnificently. If there's a villain in the piece, the villain is obviously Apollo, but Apollo cannot be a villain because he works by non-Euclidean geometry. Two and two make five for him and we can't answer questions. And this is the tragedy of human life and this is why all of Greek literature is permeated by the sense of the tragic. Another thing that Man the Measure does is it, it has to do with attitudes towards institutions towards tradition. We shall see that in one respect, the Greeks were as tenacious of tradition when it had to do with questions of style, of human behavior, as anybody in the world ever was. But in, 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 in institutions, traditional institutions, they were extraordinarily latitudinarian, cavalier, practically all of their great heroes turned out to be traitors and so on. Well, here, it's very important to understand one dichotomy 
brought in by the same sophists who talked about man the measure of all things, between thesis, which means nature, and nomos, which means law or convention. Everything in the world, the world and everything in it, has, you have to decide, it is, is it so by nature or is it so by convention? If it is so by nature, let's say gravity or the force of electricity, there's nothing you can do about it. You've got to accommodate yourself to it. But if it, if it is so by convention, there's nothing against convention. The conventions were established for good and expedient reasons. When they cease being expedient, not only may you, but must you change it, because it has no authority but the authority of man. I spoke of there being more than one strand in Greek thought. Of course, the Greek has Hesiod, for example, with the ages of man, and you start with the golden age, with a wonderful civilization given by the gods, and you go down to silver and brass and iron and so forth. But the view, the more general view, at least the sophist view, is that man started in the forest in some primitive way, leaping from limb to limb, and then established all of his institutions as they became necessary with division of professions and of labor and so on, specialization, for the sake of expediency. Now, well, uh, let me tell you how this, how this thing sort of grew. Uh, one of the earliest texts where we can see it made explicit, again, it's implicit from Homer on, but where it's made explicit is in the Dr. Hippocrates. If there are any physicians in the gathering, they will remember that they swore Hippocratic oath one time. Well, this was a pretty good doctor. He was more of a scientist than a healer. And uh, he did some uh, anatomy, and he came out with what was a very startling position, a conclusion. He said, you know that men all belong to the same species, that it is not as we thought that Africans or Asians or Greeks were different from one another. They're the same because they eat food and digest it the same way and they produce sounds the same way by the same kind of mechanism. Therefore, they're in nature one. The differences are due to environment, to circumstances. And this is all that he wanted to say. He was an anatomist. But this same notion was taken over by a Greek a sophist named Antiphon, whose works were discovered only at the turn of the century, who gave it a kind of social meaning. He said, classes, nobles and commoners, Athenians and Spartans, freemen and slaves are actually the same species in nature. They're not different. The differences between them are only conventional differences and therefore can be abandoned. I don't want to go into illustrations of this in, in the plays of Euripides, but I might mention the Medea, who uh, is pushed to do very extreme things, like killing her own children, because she's been badly abused. She's been badly abused because, she, A, she's a woman, and B, she's a foreigner. And Euripides, who is operating always with nomos and thesis, is saying, as strongly as he can, that the, the, the disabilities under which we place women, under which we place foreigners, under which we place the illegitimately born, have no basis in nature. They're just like any other people. These are conventional things. When the conventions cease being useful, they can be changed. And I think this is quite an important aspect of, of the humanist code. A couple of other little things. Um, well, I'll just take one incidental point. Suppose I say to you the word hope and say good thing or bad thing. And you will say, of course, good thing, because you have vague memories of faith, hope, and charity, and all of that, and a belief in things unseen and not. Well, I think it's very interesting, to me it's very interesting, that hope is a bad thing in so many of the Greek writers. You probably remember the story out of Hesiod of Pandora's box, 
Pandora, who is the Greek Eve, who out of her importunate curiosity opened up the box, the pethos, the jug, and let out all the bad things, calamities, catastrophes, disasters, and so forth in the world. And there, happily, hung under the lid of the, the rim of the box was hope. Well, nobody asked the question, but I wish they would. What was hope doing in a container marked calamities, catastrophes, disasters, etc.? What's she doing there? And the answer is that hope is not a good thing. To believe that something may happen when you have no rational grounds for supposing so. I mean, it's not so in logistics or any other way. You can't work it out by arithmetic and say there's a reasonable probability. This is not healthy. Or if you take the Prometheus, the play of uh, Aeschylus, and Prometheus is bragging about what he has done for mankind. He found them helpless, he gave them fire, he gave them tools to work with, he taught them agriculture, and he taught them navigation, and he gave them clothes to keep them warm, and he's discovered medicines for them, and so on. And then at the very end, and I gave them also hope, which in the doctor's terms is a kind of a placebo. When nothing else will do, nothing else can make life tolerable, you can't, can't do anything else, you take this drug, marijuana or something, you call it hope, but it isn't any good. And if you look clear-eyed at yourself and the world, uh, hope is not a good thing. Well, I'm not saying again, I repeat, that it is a good thing or a bad thing. I'm trying to explain the implications of man the measure as against uh, others. Now, as I said before, the man the measure is implicit in all this strand of thought which confronted the Hebrews. They're just, well, I might summarize it before I go into other things. It's summary is to be found in the Epicureans who provided a rationale for it. They're not very different from Homer, basically, that, that man is the measure. But we'll look very briefly at Epicureanism, which was absolutely materialistic. The world is made up of atoms, matter, and the void, and nothing else. They're gods, but they're made up of atoms. They have absolutely nothing to do with man. There is no future existence, therefore you have not to be afraid of punishments in a future world. The gods are completely indifferent, therefore man is on his own, absolutely on his own. His guide should be, one is ataraxy, which means not letting anything get in your hair, and pleasure, the pursuit of pleasure. Now the Epicureans had a very bad press, as it did the Sophists. You can see why the Sophists had a bad press, because potentially they're the most subversive people in the world. If you have to re-examine every institution every day to see if it still works, this isn't very good for a continuum in society. The Epicureans are subversive because, well, the Hebrews for one, the Romans for another, believed that they were an elite working under a divine dispensation if you deny this, if you say the gods don't care, uh, therefore all patriotism goes, everything else goes. Now, the man is absolute measure there. Um, for example, I'm confronted by this picture, which looks to me as if it contained uh, either vodka or gin. Uh, and I might be tempted to drink all of it. I will refrain from drinking all of it, because I know that the hangover tomorrow, if I lived so long, would be very much worse than the pleasure that I might get from drinking gin. If I nevertheless drink it, my mistake is not a moral one. I have not transgressed thou shalt or thou shalt not. My arithmetic has been bad, you see. And in actual fact, you see, the Epicureans have had the worst press of all eat, drink, and be merry, and so forth. They're very, very nice people. I'm going to talk about them more fully in another connection. They were supposed to be having orgies in their garden, and it turns out that most of their orgies had to do with geometry because they discovered that geometry gave the greatest pleasure with the least hangover. Uh, and they did this not for moral grounds, but 
just by simple calculation. And this is, of course, carrying to an absolute extreme man's own responsibility for himself. He has no other uh, code except pleasure, which is defined as the absence of pain, except ataraxy, which is defined as not, in, not let, letting things get into your hair. Um, uh, finally, I come to the, to, to the point which uh, I think is perhaps easiest to grapple with, but I think very significant and very frequently overlooked. It, we'll talk about patriotism, about loyalty to a certain people, to a certain tradition, to a certain code. And you find out uh, that the Hebrews, in ancient times and in modern times, are tied together, they're unified, their aspirations are defined for them, their conduct is, is, is prescribed by history. The history itself is a kind of a national charter which defines their nature as a people. I may say that the Romans operated exactly the same way. Livy's history is intentionally a kind of a scripture. Virgil is intentionally a kind of a scripture to create a sense of unity, to define the people, to define their aspirations, their duties, and so on. Now, the remarkable thing is the Greeks had nothing like it. They did not regard themselves in the as an elite. They were very proud, as I shall say presently. There wasn't even a geographical uh, definition because they were divided into city-states, which were as independent as are the sovereign states of Europe. It's all on a smaller scale, but they were very jealous of their independence. And there's actually nothing. There's no common history no common scripture, no charter to hold them together. The only thing that did hold them together was something that I should like to call style. There was a certain style to which they were extremely loyal. It was the style of Greekhood, and they defined being a Greek. But there's no authority to exact it at all. Um, People who followed this style, and you can explain this too. How do you define civilization? Well, an easy rule of thumb. Civilization is the measure of the interval from the animal. Isocrates in the fourth century had an easy ratio. He says man is to animal as Greek is to barbarian. Barbarian simply meaning non-Greek. Man is superior to animal because he has logos. And logos means reason, it means word, it means discourse, and the animal, of course, has not. Greek is superior to barbarian because he has subtle, profound, numerous, and most of all, stylish logoi, and the barbarian does not. He can just blurt out what he has to say, and it's all very simple. And the reason that the Greeks are better than anybody else is because of the superiority of their logoi. I hasten to add, because my theme is going to be fusion, that Isocrates, even in defining Greek, said, we do not define Greek by race. We define it by education. Any non-Greek who has enjoyed Greek education, who has read the Greek books, is an honorary Greek. Any Greek who has not is a barbarian, which is really extraordinary. This is, this, this is a, 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 well, we have something like that about an Amharis, but we'll come to that later, that, that an ignorant man is, is, does not really belong. Now, where, where do you find out about Greek style? Where is this? Well, the repository of style is a library of books, which were reduced almost to a canon. Here's where we get very, very close to certain Hebraic ideas. These books, if you study these, you will absorb uh, this particular style, which sets you apart from other men, which makes you akin to this particular group. It is a, a set of books, which is almost, as I said before, canonized into a special collection, a special kind of library. And to me, one of the most interesting things is that in the Hellenistic age, 
when the Greeks did the most wonderful thing that they did ever, that is in a practical sense, practical sense, I think the literature on philosophy is quite wonderful in another sense, when they Hellenized the entire ancient Near and Middle East, peoples who were originally not, not an empty continent, you know, it's not like the English coming to America, but a thickly crowded population, sophisticated, the heirs to an ancient culture from which the Greeks themselves had learned. And these people were very soon talking Greek and reading Greek books and calling themselves barbarians, incidentally. I think that this is pretty marvelous. And the question is how they did it. They did it because the, any place that the Greeks settled in the Near East, one of the first things they did was to establish a school, a gymnasium. The object of the school was to perpetuate the values of Greekhood. They're in an alien country and they've got to be themselves. So there's a certain amount of calisthenics and there's a certain amount of music, but mainly there are books. And books, not modern books or practical or technical books, but if you please, the ancient classics, and mainly Homer, which was the mainstay of education. And I would remind you that Homer is, is as ancient to people in the third and second century BC as he is to us, because after you pass five or six hundred years, it doesn't matter. The book is old, anyhow. The question is, why Homer? People have spoken of Homer as being the Bible of the Greeks. So this is very wrong because it never claimed any divine authority, but in the sense that everybody knew it and that it kept the people together, it was. And the reason they, they studied Homer, obviously, is not to learn about a little parochial war that didn't amount to anything that was legendary anyhow, but to learn Greekhood. It's the repository of a particular kind of style, which becomes very important. Well, suppose we look at what this style is like. We take the character of Achilles. Now, when I, let me add as a footnote that all of these things that I'm talking about rather at full length, I'm doing with a view to preparation for what I propose to say later, because in each case I want to have something to compare it with. But when you look at Homer and your hero is Achilles, and Achilles is a man who was given a choice for a short and, common, uh, short and glorious life or a long and commonplace one. And he deliberately chose the short and glorious life. By doing so, he transcended reflexes, animal reflexes, because animal reflex is to live as long as possible. It is exactly the same thing as in another spiritual climate, turning the other cheek or walking the second mile. But this is the important thing. He is a man who is always highly conscious of his style. I don't want to go over the whole poem, ninth book, or particularly the 24th book, when he returns the body of Hector, his whole soul is concentrated on his lust to, to, to abuse the body of Hector, and he finally brings himself to return it to Hector's father, Priam, which is the high place of the Iliad, and one is tempted to say one of the high places in all of Western literature, and he has always got his style. When he abdicates his style, he knows it. When he's about to fight Hector, and, and Hector offers to parley with him and says, lest you and I make a pact, I will agree if I kill you to return your body to your people for proper burial, and do you agree to do the same for me? And Achilles says, we can't make a pact any more than animals can. I think this is significant. I've stopped being Achilles. I'm now an animal. I can't make a bargain with you at all. And you can go on and get many examples of the same thing. This is the important thing. This is a kind of civilization. This is a kind of code. It's a heroic code. It's an aristocratic code. But this, rather than, well, what is implied by revelation, what is implied by sacred history, what is implied by contractual obligation, uh, is, is a very important difference. This is the field where we've got to get together in, 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 in certain particular ways. I might go on and say that uh, uh, Homer, primitive as he is, of course he's primitive. You wouldn't want to live with a man like Achilles. He couldn't. You might want to live with an Aeneas, who is a European hero, who's been softened 
a little bit and is carrying on a mission, uh, but not this self-obsessed person who stands out as a model of something else. The other thing is uh, the terrible importance of style in literary expression. Now, this may seem absurd, but it's terribly important. I mean, the great lesson that was learned from Homer is that if a man has something significant to say, he must not blurt it out, he must clothe it in appropriately dignified language, something that's suitable. So you get this highly stylized, artistic strand in all of, in all of Greek literature. I've mentioned tragedy at several points. Can you think of anything more stylized than that? People do not, do they normally, talk to each other in alternating lines of verse and their conversation is not interrupted by a group of 15 elderly gentlemen who come out to sing and dance to tell you what they feel about it all. This is the furthest removed from a film, a tape recording with sound of any casual encounters. It's a distillation in the mind of a poet and of a thinker. It's presented as such, it's received as such. Literature is terribly important. It is, the self is important. And you, you, uh, you, you this is the way you express yourself. Uh, one of the characteristic things of this whole way of, of thinking, I mean, you look at Achilles and you say, well, this, this is terrible, he's so self-centered, till you realize that there are verses, there's a couple of verses in the Iliad. Father sending his son out to war, uh, to his career in life, remember, son, Aye Aristuain, Kahi Perachon, Eminai Alon. Remember, son, always to excel, to be at the top, to be at the head of every list. And this, there's no people that are ever so eager to get to the top of things, to assert their individuality. This is why style is important. There were never any people that were so interested in signing their work. Um, the man wrote a play, uh, made a composition of music, not as the spirit moved him, but to enter into competition with the hope that he would get first prize and that his name would be on the record. The potter, signed even the cheapest ware, has his name on it. I think this is one of the signs of the vogue of humanism. S names decrease until you get to the Renaissance and then they burst out again. In, in the humanist thing. People again start signing their work, writing biographies, which they hadn't done, writing autobiographies like Cellini, writing like Pico della Miranda, the dignity of man, of the individual man. And you see, well, I, I could uh, close and perhaps even offer a transition to, to uh, an, another theme. Um, when people are, uh, are absorbed in an obligation, in, in, in an institution, in serving an institution like, uh, well, even Aeneas was, the individual recedes. You don't have this great emphasis. In the books of the Apocrypha, which have always been a special concern of mine, there are two books of the Maccabees, as you all know. We shall have to be referring to them presently. First Maccabees, the extant, of course, only in Greek, the first Maccabees is a translation out of a Semitic original, either Hebrew or Aramaic. It is written according to Greek modes of historiography, perfect. But it is anonymous. It isn't signed. None of the, uh, of the apocalyptic books that were written in the intertestamentary period are signed by the author's name. If you give a name, you give a name which is wrong, actually, like Solomon when he couldn't have written it to give the book credit. Second Maccabees is in a Greek book. It is an, an epitome, an abridgment of a book originally written in Greek. It is proudly signed. Jason of Cyrene wrote this book. I think that this is another aspect of it. I believe that, uh, on the whole, I've given enough specimens. Now, I don't pretend to have covered all of Greek civilization, but those aspects of it which I think are interesting to have in hand before one attempts to make a, uh, any uh, appreciative um, estimate 
of the contact between the two, these are the things that matter. Uh, humanism is not the only strand in Greek thought, but it is a significant one, and it is also the one at the polar opposite of the other strand with which it had to come to terms, which, with which it had to make peace, and the amalgam or the product of which uh, determined the character of Europe. And I think that the next time uh, what I will talk about is the actual context. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.